Welcome to another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer. Today we want to talk about insertion torque and why I think it is a terrible metric for judging primary stability. Let's get right into it. So I'm defining primary implant stability as the resistance to rotation and bodily movements in three dimensions. So if you look at this implant right here and you moved, it, you can't move it along the Y axis, you can't move it along the X axis, and if you can't move it along the Z axis, then that would be the resistance to movement along these three axes. Now each one of these axes has a rotational component to it. So the implant itself could rotate about the X, it could rotate about the Y, and it can rotate about the Z. The Z rotation is our insertion rotation. So that one rotation is the one that we measure our torque on, right? But it doesn't have anything to do with those other five movements, does it? So let's get into it a little bit more. Insertion torque is a poor indicator of primary implant stability. Here's an equation, and just bear with me because I'm going to summarize this really quickly in about 30 seconds. But here's the equation for what torque is. Torque is equal to the friction on the threads of the implant to bone and the distance of the device you're measuring. We know that the thread friction, friction is, it, is equivalent to mu, which is a coefficient of friction, times the normal force. The normal force is equal to the stress on the bone times the bone to implant contact area. And the stress on the bone is equal to the modulus of elasticity of the bone times the strain of the bone. Now, don't turn me off yet. Watch. We're going to insert this stress into that equation. We're going to insert this normal into that equation. And we're going to insert this friction into that equation. And we get this. All of this can be rearranged to this. Everything inside of the parentheses is a constant. So if I replace everything here with the word constant, what you get is this. Torque is equal to some constant for that given case times the strain in the bone. Remember what strain is. Strain is displacement. It's how far we move something. That's the strain. So if we have a case like this and we have an implant going in and with a properly designed implant, the green line represents the pitch diameter. It's really halfway between the major diameter and the minor diameter. It's usually about halfway between. And what that means is that if we remove the green bone, everything that's inside the green, all that bone goes away. When you place your implant, the little part of the tip of the thread right here is what actually engages the bone. And in this space right here, there's a little space. Now what happens is as this bone is compressed, it presses the bone and any debris into that little space in between. So let's run through it. We have the bone, we come down with our drill, and we create an osteotomy. The green line is our outline for our ideal tapered drill. We're going to remove the green line and we're going to insert our implant. Now at this point, what we have done is all of these little tips of the threads have squeezed the bone out like this. So where you see red is where you have strain. And in this case, the strain is uniform across the entire system because each thread has moved the bone the same amount, okay? Now, the strain is the same, but the stress is not. If you look here on this implant right here, you can see there's a little bit of black space right there. This is at the time of placement. And what you can see is there's no bone around the crustal region. Why? Because it, the drill has removed it. So there's no concern for any sort of excessive crestal stress in this region. If we go to the second example of how we would potentially do an implant, we could use a tap. The way a tap works is you drill the hole and you insert a special tool that kind of looks like an implant, but it actually cuts the grooves inside the bone. Now, when we go back to place the implant, the threads of the implants are going to engage these pre cut grooves in the bone. So the implant goes in in this case. So riddle me this. This implant has been inserted with what torque? And the answer is almost none. Almost zero torque. Because it didn't have to compress the bone because the bone was cut. There was a path for the threads to go in, so there's no compression here. So this implant would register during insertion maybe zero to five newton centimeters of torque. However, you can't move this implant. It would be darn near impossible to move the implant this way, this way, or this way in this scenario. Thus, when we say, I have an insertion torque and that is telling me what my stability is, 
it really is a poor metric for which we should be judging this by. This is a, a prime example of zero torque, but great insertion torque, but with great primary stability. Now, here's an example of a case that failed. I want to show this as an, an illustration of this implant failed when we backed it out of the hole here. These little grooves here are the grooves that were cut by the implant into the bone. So that's what you would get if you tapped a hole. If you tapped a hole first and then placed an implant second, you'd have almost zero insertion torque. Okay, so already you're starting to say, well, that makes a lot of sense. Torque is not a great measurement of primary stability. But what about engaging cortical bone? So if we look at the cortical bone in the literature, it says cortical bone is about a 13.7 Young's modulus, and Kinsella's bone is a 1.37. What that means is that the stiffness of the cortical bone is about 10 times that of the trabecular bone. Okay. We kind of know that the stiffness of cortical bone, cortical bone is more stiff than trabecular bone. Well, how does that play out? Well, you recall that if we have an equal amount of strain on this, on the bottom of this axis here, we have strain. That's how much we move the bone. How much we move the bone is measured here. This is how much force it's required to move the bone. So with the same amount of strain, the force on the trabecular bone might be one Newton per meter squared. So that stress on the bone would be a low stress, one. But with the same strain on cortical bone, the force on the bone might be 10 times that. So 10 newtons per meter squared. So you're saying, okay, uh, what does that mean? Well, let's go back to an example of, a, of an extraction site. So we take the tooth out, and after we take the tooth out, we have lamina dura, right? We have lamina dura. So let's call it for this practical purposes, that's like cortical bone. We come in and we drill our osteotomy, and when we do, we remove the cortical bone here, but we leave it here, we remove it here, but we leave it here. And here is, is still intact. So these regions are still hard and these regions are trabecular. So now when we come in and we insert our implants, what I want to bring to your attention are threads two, seven, eight, and nine. Those threads are engaging cortical bone. These threads are engaging trabecular bone, soft bone. So watch what happens. All of the bone is displaced the same amount. So thread seven displaces the bone the same amount as thread six. The difference is, is that thread seven is engaging cortical bone and thread six is engaging trabecular bone. Now, if we change the strain, how much we move the bone, and we translate that into stress, this is what we see. The green is indicative of the magnitude of the stress on the bone. So what would happen in a case like this, in a fresh extraction socket, the stress here in the middle of the implant would be really, really high. The stress towards the apical on both sides would be moderate to low, but stress on thread two would be extremely high. Therefore, you might get a cumulative torque, insertion torque on a case like this of let's say 30 as a cumulative. The problem is, is that the stress here around this region might be 10 times higher than that. Why is that important? Well, if pressure necrosis was a real thing, if we really had the ability to squeeze bone till it died, then what we would see is we would see bone necrosis in the middle and at the apex, a two, and nothing here, okay? And that just doesn't make sense to me. So let's do one more example. Here's a virtual plan in the lower right. So here's your mylohyoid undercut, right? Right here. And we've got this nice big implant planned. And you can see that this person's a big person. They're, they have a big mandible. So all of this side of my implant is engaging trabecular bone. It's a healed site. There's no cortical bone on the superior aspect because it's three months after the initial e extraction. On the lingual, we're engaging trabecular bone, all the way down, trabecular bone, except for right here. So if I drop an implant in, what you see is these three threads right here are engaging the dense cortical plate of the undercut, but this is all soft bone. So let's follow the same logic. Everywhere you see a red arrow, the bone has been strained or displaced an equal amount. But if we change the red to green for the stress, the stress is small across all of these threads, and it's small across all of these threads, but these three threads will have a tenfold magnitude increase in stress. In stress. It's 10 times more stress than this, and this is a graphical representation of the difference. If this is one, this is 10x. 
Well, what does that mean? That means I may place this implant with a cumulative insertion torque of say 45 Newton centimeters, but it's not indicative of the stress distribution of the implant to the bone. All of this bone right here would be stressed moderate to low amounts. This bone would be stressed extremely high. Thus, if we had the concept of pressure necrosis in this case, what you would see is after insertion, some period of time later, we will theoretically, we would have killed this bone. We would have an apical radiolucency and then potentially lose the implant from the bottom up. And that just doesn't seem to happen. Clinically, I've never seen that in my practice where I've seen an implant placed and then I have apical radiolucencies that appear later that results in an implant failure due to something called hypothetical pressure necrosis. So, I hope this has been helpful in trying to clear up the concepts of pressure necrosis and how torque is a measurement, but it's not a great measurement for insertion torque, or for insertion stability rather. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.